Hello, everyone. I'm Carrie Tirado Brayman, director of the UB Gender Institute and professor of English, and I'm delighted to kick off a new series that the Institute is hosting called New Books, New Feminist Directions. The inspiration for this series came from the University of Michigan's Institute for Research on Women and Gender and their New Works, New Questions series. So one of our speakers today knows this series very well. And though I've never attended the Michigan series, I like very much the idea of promoting our own faculty's amazing research accomplishments and sort of recognizing that achievement. And we're having three such events this academic year, beginning with Stephanie Vanderville's wonderful book, Hillbilly Maidens, Okies and Cowgirls, Women's Country Music, 1930 to 1960, published by the University of Illinois Press in 2020. And I'll say more about today's book in a moment, but I also want to think ahead to the spring semester and I'm asking you to save the date if you're interested. We'll be hosting two more of these virtual book launches. On March 8th at noon, we'll be featuring Professor Victoria Wolcott's Living in the Future, Utopianism, and the Long Civil Rights Movement that Chicago will be releasing that same week in early March um, in 2022. And then on eight, Friday, April 8th at 2 p.m., we'll be having a hybrid event with uh, our colleague Yasmina Tumbas and her book forthcoming with Manchester University Press in 2022 called I Am Yugoslavenka, Feminist Performance Politics During and After Yugoslav Socialism. So that's coming up in the spring. So turning to today's event, I just want to say a few words about Stephanie's book and introduce our speakers and then turn it right over to them. Stephanie Vanderville's Hillbilly Maidens, Okies and Cowgirls, Women's Country Music 1930 to 1960 is a tour de force taking us through the 20th century through its women country music stars, Patsy Montana, Rose Maddox, and Kitty Wells. Through these women and many others, including the legendary Lula Bell, Vanderville tells the story of how their music, which includes their voice, their bodies, their lyrics, grapple with the contested ground of femininity, sexuality, someone needs to turn off their mic, femininity, sexuality, and domesticity. Through women's country music, Professor Vanderville uses popular culture to talk about the intersections of sexuality, gender, region, class, and race. And you can't read Stephanie's book without stopping every page to look up the performances on YouTube, such as Rose Maddox, Move It On Over, which I have in my head this morning. Um, Hillbilly Maidens has been recognized by Pop Matters as one of the top nonfiction books for 2020. I just want to introduce Stephanie now for those who don't know her. Uh, she's my colleague of uh, historical musicology at the University of Buffalo. Her research and teaching interests focus on the singing voice, performance and representations of gender, class, race, and region in country music, specifically popular music and American music more generally. And besides her book, she's published on Jean Autry and Patsy Montana, Loretta Lynn and the Singing Voice, and Webb Pierce and the Weeping Male Figure in Honky Tonk. Uh, she has an article forthcoming on comedy and women's contemporary country music entitled Pistol Annie's Country Rebels with Humor. Great title, Stephanie. Um, you know, at the summer I asked Stephanie who she would like to be in conversation with for this event, and she immediately said Nadine Hubbs. And I'm just delighted to have Professor Hubbs with us today. Um, she's a musicologist, historian, and theorist whose work on popular and classical music recasts social perspectives of people marked by sexuality and gender, class, race, and migration. She's the author of essays on subjects including 1970s disco, Leonard Bernstein, and Taylor Swift, among others, and two award-winning books, The Queer Composition of America's Sound, and Rednecks, Queers, and Country Music. Most recently, she co-edited the 2020 collection Uncharted Country, New Voices and Perspectives in Country Music Studies. And her work has been featured in the New York Times, LA Times, The Guardian, NPR, Pacifica, BBC Radio, and many other outlets, including Dolly Parton's America podcast. Professor Hub's current project is titled Country Mexicans, Sounding Mexican American Life, love and belonging in country music. And she's a professor of women's and gender studies and music and faculty affiliate in American culture 
at the University of Michigan. So for today's event, the format is Stephanie will talk about her book briefly, and then uh, Professor Hubs will offer a commentary, and then we're going to open it up to questions. So please include your questions in the chat box, and either I can read it out loud or you can unmic yourself to ask your questions. So with that, let's turn it to Professor Stephanie Vanderville. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank the Gender Institute for the invitation to be part of the new books, new feminist directions, and also big, big thanks to Dean Hubs for being here today. Really appreciate it. So I'm going to share my screen. And here we go. And I think that works. Everyone can see that. Although I can't see you any longer, Libby. <laughs> there, it's there. Okay, <laughs> great. All right, so I thought I would just talk a bit about why I wrote this book on women's country music and some of the themes coming out of it. What first caught my ear about women's country music of the 1930s to the 60s were the musical narratives that offered varying perspectives about the concerns and desires of women that pushed against gender norms. The music complicates the usual historical accounts of women in the US that centers on the gendered ideals of white heterosexual middle-class women focusing on the home as wives and mothers until the 1970s women's liberation movement. In addition, women's country music um, is a way into an expressive field where representations of gender, sexuality, class and region counter what the sociologist Julie Betty calls the injury of invisibility of working class women. If femininity is a white middle class identity and the working class has largely been defined by masculinity, especially as it relates to white manual labor, then there's not much room for understanding the subject positions of working class women. The book thus takes a critical look at how the musical and theatrical performances of mid-century female country artists illuminated the dynamic and paradoxical tensions of white rural working class women, um, women's relationships to gender norms. These performative roles included the singing cowgirl, as you see her on the front cover of my book, <laughs> rejecting the trappings of domesticity to wanting to roam the Magin Wild West, the hillbilly comedian, critiquing the gender economy of the home and marriage in her parodies of white Southern rustic womanhood and the sexualized honky-tonk angel longing for the security of the domestic while frequenting the licentious working class jeep joint. These representations engage with the shifts of gender roles inflected by the Great Depression, World War II, and post-World War II. For instance, the singing cowgirl's expressions of autonomy can be heard as a response to the expanding roles of women in the public sphere, beginning in the 1930s when women took over the, the breadwinning role in the face of um, male unemployment. I'm also interested in how these roles, how these performative roles were enacted vocally. What sort of singing approaches were employed to play the part of the hillbilly maiden or the honky-tonk angel, for example. The theatrics of country music rooted in the practices of popular theater enabled female artists to put on and take off a range of sonic roles that combined musical conventions of the past with contemporary idioms of country and popular musics. Throughout, I point to the thespian fluidity of a range of performers pushing against the ways the country music industry marketed female artists really through a modernist lens of tradition, nostalgia, and domestic femininity. The country music industry often stressed the private roles of female artists, specifically of this era, as wives and mothers in their marketing attempts to, of, of, um, of marketing the genre as a viable source of respectability to meet the acceptance of mainstream audiences. Against this frame, I trace the performative vibrancy of female country artists in a variety of media, radio, film, and recording, and locate women at important historical points of production of country music. Oops, and let me, there, and there's my table of contents. So the commercial development of country music in specific geographical locales are main themes of the book. And here's the table of contents. There's a focus on w WLS, Chicago's radio station, the California country music industry, and then Nashville, 
all major production centers of country music. And so the con this conceptual and historical frame also includes notions of place, migration out of the South, and displacement, all of which having a bearing on spreading country music throughout the US, and the development of particular musical styles, including Western swing, rockabilly, and honky-tonk, in which the women of my study help shape as vocalists. The book begins with Lulu Bell and Patsy Montana on Chicago's WLS radio station and the National Barn Dance. And here are some photos from trade magazines of the National Barn Dance. At this time, WLS was a major radio station of country music, broadcasting various styles, folk songs, newly composed sentimental songs, comedic numbers, cowboy songs, cowgirl songs, to a heterogeneous audience of European immigrants, Southern migrants, urbanites, and farmers. In this performance environment, there's Lulu Bell. Lulu Bell was a featured attraction of the Saturday evening program, The National Barn Dance, in which her skits and songs purposely played up her hillbilly identity in, performance of dis of, in performances of um, disruption and transgression. She literally would disrupt the performances of other <laughs> artists. She, she was quite, <laughs> quite the performer. Um, also on WLS, various broadcasts um, included Patsy Montana, who would perform her well-known self-composed cowgirl songs, such as I Want to Be a Cowboy Sweetheart, the first song written and recorded by a female country artist to sell a million copies. The second um, section focuses on Carolina Cotton and Rose Maddox in the Los Angeles country music scene of the 40s and 50s. The migration from the Southern Plains to California during the Great Depression and World War, and World War II resulted in an emerging Oki audience in a vibrant live performance context of dance halls and roadhouses, which incorporated the theatrics coming out of Barn Dance Radio and also the theatrics of um, the 19th century saloon. In this context, Carolina Cotton emerged as a virtuosic yodeler performing with leading Western swing ensembles and later appeared in film. Also, Rose Maddox and her family band, the Maddox Brothers and Rose, established themselves as the most colorful hillbilly band in America, largely because of their musical parodies of country music. Rose Maddox later became a solo recording artist of honky tonk and rockabilly in the Los Angeles um, country music industry, paving the way for other female vocalists and soloists in these styles. The book concludes with 1950s Nashville, a city that has emerged at the center of country music production. And this center started to take place in the late 40s, in which the honky tonk style became a predominant mode and spoke of the exodus out of the South to the Midwest. Women's honky tonk of the 50s brought representations of white working class womanhood into the style's sonic experience. They took on the tropes of male honky tonk by turning the objects of men's songs into viable subjects, such as the honky tonk angel, the jilted lover, the angry housewife, or the single mother. Here I address the music of Kitty Wells, dubbed the first queen of country music, Jean Shepard, who left Los Angeles for Nashville in the 1950s, and Goldie Hill, who also recorded Honky Tonk hit songs during this era. And this photo of Goldie Hill, this is the first time I think a woman's on the front cover of Country Song, country song and Roundup, a major trade magazine of the country music industry. The book ends by examining how the tropes of respectability and influenced the marketing of these women, but also their male peers in Honky Tonk as well, right? Everyone's singing about, you know, nothing but, you know, every, all the narratives are pushing against like the ideals of 1950s domesticity. So the question is, how does the country music industry market the men and women of the style? Since the women, women of my study were vocalists, the book emphasizes the aesthetic choices of individual artists in respect to singing styles and techniques. I am concerned about the sonic qualities of women's singing voices and their artistic choices. So bringing the agency back into the performance through, through, through what they're doing vocally in the recording studio, in live performance, on radio, and in film. Many vocalists in my study use nasal twang techniques 
combined with nasal singing approaches. So nasal twang techniques provide that brassy loud nasal sound where you kind of where you create a kind of a resonator in the back of the throat. It's loud, it's meant to project. And nasal singing is where, where um, more of like a singing through the nose. So you close the back of the throat and push the air through the nose. Both of these um, singing approaches, particularly when they're used in the upper chest register of men and women's voices, but I'm talking mostly about women here, the upper chest register result in physical and vocal tension. The physical tension is the tightening of the tongue. You know, the tongue's an ah, like here in the front of the mouth, the tongue, you know, the tongue, mouth, and throat muscles, right? The pharynx and the larynx, and provide an aesthetic of strain, right? The kind of this acoustic strain associated with white Southern vernacular culture. And we can hear this vocal strain in the 1950s honky tonk ballads of Kitty Wells. So, so I thought I would play a little bit of music and, um, and then open up the conversation with, um, with Dean with, um, and, then, um, and then I can play some more music. So this is Kitty Wells singing, You're Not Easy to Forget, 1953 with Decca. And the thing with Kitty Wells is that Owen Bradley, her producer, purposely arranged her songs in higher keys. So she had to really strain and push the chest voice high up there. And he, he wanted that sound. And she does it with a lot of vibrato too. So she really wanted that chest voice in the upper range and it exploits that nasally strident vocal timbre. And this becomes the musical voice of the honky tonk angel in the 1950s, right? Voicing, voicing like loss and desire. And so what you're gonna hear is you got to hear Kitty Wells operating in honky tonk, the double stops on the fiddle, the steel guitar, the boom chuck, boom chuck kind of rhythmic approach, because this is music, right, that we dance to in the honky tonk, right, music. And you're going to hear her like giving a, you know, expressing sexual longing and she goes high in the chest voice and then in the, especially in the bridge and then the closing phrase, she sings a few like kind of bluesy, she sings a bit of a bluesy vocal line. So let's listen. I make all the honky tonks and taverns just to see who's hanging round, and there I try to drown my sorrow. Um, Nadine, if you want to, should we talk a little bit about this song or should we listen to more music? It's really up to you, but just so, but this was like, this is Kitty Wells, right? Her first hit song in 1952. She's singing as a response to Hank Thompson. You know, it wasn't God. It wasn't God who made Honky Tonk Angels, meaning it wasn't God who made cheating women, <laughs> right? So she responds and and then this the market opens up within Nashville for the woman singing from, from the perspective of the woman who has been cheated on or sexualized, right? The honky tonk angel originally being kind of a sexualized object in songs by like Al Dexter, honky tonk baby girl. Yeah, and I don't know, uh I would love to talk with you about this example, Stephanie. I just want to mention, um, for those, I know some of you know this field well, and some of you may not know it as well, but a honky-tonk angel uh, sounds like a nice thing to call someone. And uh, what what did it really mean, Stephanie? 
<laughs> it means a strumpet, right? It means a, it's like a femme fatale. It's the woman who will lure the man into the honky tonk. And the honky tonk, right, being a working class juke joint, often coming out of places of displacement of migration out of the South, honky tonks. So they're not the good part of town, right? They're kind of right, and, it, and it can carry implications of a honky tonk hooker, right? Right, 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 definitely. Right. Um, so uh, it was it was a pleasure to hear you talk about this, and I and I want to hear more music. Um, I don't want to go into my little spiel yet because I would love for you to. Um, I had never heard before. Uh, I mean, I've written a little bit about Kitty Wells, but not as much as you have here in the book, and. Um, I hadn't heard before that Owen Bradley had pushed her to uh, emphasize her top uh, notes. And listening to this song again after you had said that um, kind of changed my whole uh, hearing of an artist I've known forever. Um, I, I can imagine, and you talk in the book about the tension and you talk about that tension in multiple dimensions, right? The vocal tension, um, being, uh, uh, kind of, um, uh, representative of, of social tensions and gender tensions. Uh, what does that do when Owen Bradley, uh, makes his singer, uh, yeah, no, we're not going to do this in B flat. We're going to do it in, in D. <sighs> <laughs> he wants that. He wants that vocal sound of tension. He wants that chest voice about to break, right? That where it sounds labored, where it's a lot of, you know, it's kind of strident, kind of the strident sound. I think that's what he wants um, Kitty Wells in particular to sing. Now, the other women in Honky Tonk, like Jean Shepard, she would go up and hurt. I mean, Jean Shepard's songs were pitched lower in range, right? And so were Goldie Hills. So in particular with Kitty Wells is the first woman who breaks into the Nashville, right? I mean, women have always been in country music and they've always been huge commercial successes. But Kitty Wells is one of the first women to break into the Nashville scene. And it's a voice, right? It's a voice of tension and, and strife. She's not thinking well, that she's a honky-tonk strumpet or a honky-tonk hooker. She's putting a lot of tension behind that identity, but at the same time, voicing that identity. Right. She is in the honky tonk. You know, she's in the honky tonk and you're not easy to forget. She's in the honky tonk saying, I, I can't forget you and I long and want you. So and, and you talk about him, uh, Bradley, pushing her uh, toward her vocal break. And it, of course, there's so much heartbreak in the songs of so. So vocal break is heartbreak. Um, I, I'm really happy to be here. I'm delighted to be here. And in addition to um, celebrating uh, the publication of Stephanie's book, um, I want to, my goal, it, and I have been one, through one of these myself, as Carrie said in her introduction, um, I'm at University of Michigan and this is, and, and I, I'm a director of a program, the Lesbian Gay uh, Queer Research Initiative um, at Michigan and have been for many years. And so I'm, I'm very closely linked with the Institute for Research on Women and Gender that um, came up with this format and, and got to uh, enjoy it with the publication of my last book, Rednecks, Queers and Country Music. So I had commentators speaking on my book and, um, I am going to speak a little bit, but I actually just really want to get into dialogue with Stephanie and pick her brain and um, hear some of her examples. So I also have a lot of questions for her. Um, um, do you want to go on to the rosematics example? Do you want to, or do you, or I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Um, we can go into that really, really soon. Um, oh. But I, I I, uh, I just want to say a little bit um, to everybody who's here about, um, I, I think that this is a project of, of very long labor and incubation, right? And um, the number of archival primary sources is, is huge. And the hours in the archives uh, with old records and, and um, documents, I, I can't even imagine. Um, and 
all different archives. And as, as you said, you focus on three distinct um, geographic locales. Um, and so it's, it's really uh, a moment for celebration to see this uh, project come to fruition. And, and uh, I, I wanna congratulate you on, on your enormous achievement, Stephanie, and, and your contribution to your uh, multiple fields. Thank you. And it's, and it's such a delight to be here, not just celebrating it with you, but able to pick your brain. And, um, and everyone else is gonna get a chance to pick your brain as well. <laughs> um, so uh, I wanna talk then a little bit about the intervention um, that you make with Hillbilly Maidens, Okies and Cowgirls. Um, it's a book that um, led me, it leads me to recalibrate and reorient in relation to uh, narratives and understandings of, of several interlocked histories. Um, the early days of radio records and the music industry in the United States, um, as well as the Great Depression, Northern migration, uh, Dust Bowl migration of the Okies, um, and especially of, of country music. Um, and, and of American women, uh, particularly white working class and rural uh, American women. And it um, causes me, it, it leads me to recalibrate my understandings of all these um, histories in, in relation to shifting moments of popular culture, of um, gendered style, of class, of family, of heterosexual relations, um, community, and, and I would say whiteness. And I'm struck by the ways, Stephanie, that your book illustrates, um, along with other scholarship like that of uh, um, country historians Bill C. Malone, um, Richard Peterson, um, who also writes so much about the construction of the hillbilly, um, and James Akinson, who's with us today, um, illustrates the remarkable power of country music. And, and some of you who don't do country music, uh, I, I want to impress this upon you. Country music's an incredibly potent vehicle for telling 20th century social and cultural history. And I guess Ken Burns gave uh, uh, some sense of that to a mass audience with his um, uh, country music um, series uh, in, what was it, 2019? Yeah, I think so. 2019. So, so I'm struck by the ways your book illustrates these things, the, the, the remarkable power of, of, of country music, which, which other writers have, have done too, to, uh, using country music as a vehicle for 20th century social and cultural history. Um, but I'm also struck by the way that you managed to defamiliarize the mid 20th century. And I thought I kind of knew the mid 20th century. Um, I, I wrote about that period in my first book. <laughs> my first book, The Queer Composition of America's Sound, was also focused on um, 1930s to maybe early 1960s. So pretty much the same period. And um, you defamiliarize that period for me in a way that I really appreciate. Um, and I think that uh, you managed to do that by focusing, focusing on artists and audience and, and aesthetics and social and economic realities, first of all, of the US working class, particularly the white working class. Um, and, and homing in on, on three distinct geographic locales. And um, on not only the working class, but also uh, women, women as artists, audiences, uh, women's aesthetics and social and economic and sexual uh, and relational realities. Um, because you tell this story you, t you tell your history from the perspective of women's lives and art and their careers and their innovations and uh, their 
their frustrations and, and hopes and dreams. Um, and, and, uh, and their sense of humor and, um, and with, with particular emphases. So that brings me to this, you particularly emphasize things that aren't always emphasized in histories of, uh, the mid 20th century, um, and, and are not emphasized in those previous male centered histories of early country music. The ones that focus on, on figures like fiddling John Carson, Vernon Dalhart, Jimmy Rogers, the singing brakeman, Hank Williams, right? We're familiar with those stories. Um, if we, if we read in, in country music studies and, and, uh, read the early, uh, the early period of, of country music, but by contrast, you go, um, into different emphases in your focus on uh, women, you go deep into the theatrical dimensions of uh, the craft and artistry of these women artists, which you trace back to minstrelsy and vaudeville. So that gives us a very different perspective that I, that defamiliarizes the period for me and uh, makes this book uh, fascinating. And um, as well, you emphasize, of course, these women artists singing voices, the singing voice. And you are a singer, surely. Right. Not very good. I have to say I'm not that great. But I, I did sing every, I taught myself to yodel. I, I did it all. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that was painful, by the way, finding <laughs> and exploiting it <laughs> my uh, relationship survived it because you know, <laughs> it was loud <laughs> but, yeah so and and that and and now we can understand your acknowledgement section better but <laughs> <laughs> um so uh, you know you have these emphases on on the theatrical tropes the theatrical um qualities um, and innovations and, and, and histories that these artists bring forth, bring forward. And, and the singing voice, which you um, listen closely to, and then you tie to history, essentially, you, and, 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 and society and culture. You tie their uh, singing voices, the qualities of their singing voices, their vocal gestures, their, their vocality overall. You tie it to shifting messages of um, gender and class, sexuality for sure. And I, I want to hear you annotate or discuss some of the examples that you play today in those terms so that the folks here today get a sense of all that you bring out uh, by listening closely to the singing voice. You talk also about these uh, working class women and the importance of glamor. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just tossing some seeds out that I would love to hear you speak speak more about. Very Glamour, good. particularly in relation to white working class women, um, is an intriguing topic. The importance of glamour. Even though working class women's glamour wasn't glamorous in uh, mainstream culture, glamour was very important to them. And, and you highlight that. And, um, and, and give it texture. Um, these distinct locales, which again, um, for those who, who are in country music studies, they would know, but if you're not specifically a specialist in country music studies, you wouldn't know that it's not all about Nashville. The history um, of Chicago loomed very large and larger than Nashville um, in the early part of this period, in, in, in these early decades. Um, Nashville hadn't yet declared itself the center of the country music universe and WLS, the world's largest store, the call letters for uh, the radio station in the, um, owned by the Sears Roebuck uh, company and what, in the Sears Tower? Yeah, yes. <clears throat> Which made it an incredibly powerful signal pumping out to really distant parts of the country. Um, so you had, uh, yeah, Nashville gets in there, but uh, Chicago and the radio station WLS and the barn dances back then, and then Chicago, I, I mean, California, um, which uh, includes Bakersfield. Um, yeah. 
It does. I mean, Rose Maddox is out there in Modesto in that area. But it's not only about Bakersfield, which yeah. later it became California, you know, in the 60s was mm -hmm. Merle Haggard and Buck Owens and the Buckaroos. And they were all about Bakersfield. But you show us a, a much broader um, uh, uh, sort of um, soundscape of country in California. Um, so uh, I think, I think uh, I would love to, you also to, I would love to hear more of your thoughts um, about the role of race in uh, all this. Um, it, because, it, and then because it's such a central part of your, your book, your study, um, more about the role of vocal style and vocal technique in shaping these oral metaphors of class and region and gender. Um, you already talked about the nasal inflected twang. Uh, it's not only something that, that we scholars and journalists of country music um, refer to in our accounts of the music, but it's something that sets people's teeth on edge if <laughs> they are country haters. Right. And so it really signifies on, yeah. on all sides, right? For lovers and haters. Um, and then you really uh, deepen the, the gender dimension of it. So that's another thing uh, that I'm really interested if, if on that. Um, it needs to meet the, there we go. What's that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Some background noise, but go ahead. Right. And then, um, you know, I can ask you this again because I'm, I know I'm throwing a lot of questions at you, but um, in the final tally, I would love to know, um, like, what does this all add up to? You you spoke of the Loretta Lynn example, Webb Pierce. Who else did you mention? Oh, at the end of the book? Is that what you're talking about? Or? I mean, in your spiel. Oh, in, in my spiel. Um, well, I have, oh, like, like, um, um, I mean, I've written about Webb Pierce, but I also write about Webb Pierce singing with Kitty Wells, too, in the 50s. Oh, that's right. It was Carrie's introduction, speaking of some of your other publications. Yeah, Webb yeah. Pierce, Kitty Wells, who else was in there? Uh, Loretta Lynn. Right, Loretta Lynn. Yeah, right. Loretta Lynn sounding a lot like Kitty Wells in her first recording, right? Honky Tonk. Her first recording, uh, on in her first Honky Tonk recording, I think it was 1960, she really imitates Kitty Wells's vocals. And that's it's, really interesting because we know that her best friend back here just over my shoulder and <laughs> and the person she was really really obsessed with um it was Patsy Cline. It was right. Patsy Cline. There's right. there's my poster y'all. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> there's Patsy. Yeah, so Loretta Lynn, she starts out really with that strident nasally really um like tense and constricted sound. And then by the time we get to Don't Come Home a Drink and She's opened it up and she's yeah. and she sounds great. And you know, anytime you watch like those recordings, and she when Loretta Lynn goes high in her range and she's belting the high chest voice, she has to pull the mic away from her because she's gonna blow yes. this, right? Because so yeah. she has really broad sounding voice that we hear with Rose Maddox, right? We hear with Rose Maddox coming out of like a performance environment uh, where you have one mic or maybe two the most and you're performing in these large dance halls. You know, Rose Maddox could belt. So yeah, so I've written about Loretta Lynn and I guess- and, and, and let me just say, I think that your contribution to what I'm just gonna call the, the semiotics of country vocality <laughs> is the, um, the, the uh, most important contribution to date. Um, in, in that field. And, and I wonder what you take from not only this book, but all the other work you've done on artists like uh, Webb Pierce and, and Loretta Lynn and, and others, some of whom fall after the 1960s. Um, what, is, what does it all add up to in, in terms of um, 
uh, you know, uh, change over time uh. in both vocality and the things that you track through vocality, like class and gender. Right. There's some things that haven't changed, right? Like if you think of Natalie Maine singing White Trash Wedding with the chicks, what, how does she sing that? With some serious nasal twang and the high chest voice to really stress the class dynamic, the class narrative of White Trash Wedding, right? She's playing up that sound. And, and then she can, and then Natalie may, Main, she can also sing with more rounded tones when she sings a cowgirl song, right? Or she, even Goodbye Earl is not as nasal. Right, Goodbye Earl, but very funny, but right, right, right. Yeah, girl, right, you're right. Goodbye Earl isn't nasal. You're right, yeah. So I think it really, so I think some of these vocal kind of performance modes become like I said in like my spiel, like these sonic roles that you can take on and off, you know? I mean, and I think that's why like the book um, implicitly pushes against this age old narrative of authenticity and country. But, you know, Richard Peterson was writing about this too, even in relation to Hank Williams, he took it apart. And, um, and, I, and I continue to want to like, you know, there is this a connection and I do connect it, like you said, so, you know, eloquently to like, to history, to social things in the mid-century. But um, I mean, there is that, but also this is, perf this is performance, right? This is performance with, and even though it might be theatrical, it doesn't mean that it didn't have meaning and significance and weight and for the listening audience and and yeah, no, and, and when you say, but this is performance, what I, at least part of what I understand you to be saying there is like, these artists are sort of charged with a, a duty to represent not just but, but both what, what y'all's lives are like, y'all in the audience, what y'all's lives are like, but also what they aren't like and you dream of them right. being like. Right, the aspirations, right, the hopes, right, the hopes of upward mobility or and everything that comes with it. Yeah, it's, right, <laughs> or supposed to come with it. <laughs> you know? So, right, yes. Yeah, so there's that, and and like you know, so there's part of what it tallies up to, and I mean, kind of the big prick picture. And a lot of this is funny, right? I mean, Kitty Wells is not funny. <laughs> this is serious music. But Rose Maddox is hilarious. Lulu Bell is hilarious. I mean, you know, Gene Shepard could be funny. Gene uh, Carter was hilarious. Yeah, Gene Carter was hilarious. You're right. And I, I have written a couple of conference papers on her, and uh, she's one of my next ideas. Yes, she is hilarious. So, um, so there's a lot of comedy and fun and play and pleasure in all of this of kind of taking like, and I think a lot of the pleasure and fun and comedy comes from taking these tropes that get mapped onto class, especially the working class, tropes of sexuality, of being heightened, you know, this heightened sexuality. And, you know, you've written about this as well in country music, right? Like Sherry Ortner, Beverly Skaggs pointing to the ways that sexuality becomes a metaphor for class in a society in the US where we don't really have a discourse to talk about class. So a heightened sexuality becomes that. And, um, and so somebody like Rose Maddox kind of makes fun of that, kind of blows it up to like, to exaggeration, to like comedic, you know, proportions where it's unbelievable, right? We this would, this. <laughs> yeah, so this would be a great time to play that clip for us, if you okay. would. I will, I will. Let me get back to you. So this is Rose Maddox. So this is with her family band, the Maddox Brothers and Rose. And this was one of their, um, they did a lot of covers, a lot of covers of songs. That was mostly what they did. And you can think of the Maddox Brothers and Rose as really coming out of the roadhouses of Central California. And then they got invited more to be in the dance halls of Southern California competing against like Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys and things like that. But their recording, they record first, their first recording contract is with Four Star Records. And that's, I think, from 47 to 52. And Don Pierce, this producer, was just like, I will do nothing except hit record and point, and you guys do the rest. 
So, which is very different with from their Columbia rec rec um, recordings. A lot of the same material, but not the theatrics or not the over the top kind of interesting. So what we get with their recordings of this time period with Four Star is a bit of a sense, I think a huge sense of what's happening live. What, you know, I think they just translated live performance to, to the record. So I wanna play just speak in case, you know, um, we're not as all familiar, but I just want to with um, these examples. So there, so it is a honky tonkin is a cover of Hank Williams, right? The father of country, you know, kind of the canonical figure. Hank, Hank Williams records um, honky tonkin in forty eight, and honky tonkin, like taking the term honky tonk, which is a working class juke joint, to drink how meet up with people, you know, have these fleeting sexual encounters where the licentious, you know, honky tonk, like hooker is there, you know, all of that takes place in the honky tonk. And, but Hank Williams turns honky tonk into a verb, honky tonkin. And he's really playing the part of, of as Barbara Ching has said, the gigolo, kind of enticing a woman who's unhappy in her marriage to come out honky tonkin, but she has to she has to bring her own money. She has to pay for the expense of going honky tonkin. So let's, let's listen to Hank Williams and you'll hear what he does. You know, he does a lot of um, vocal breaks. You know, he highlights the break between the chest to the falsetto on the, on the refrain when he keeps on repeating the word honky tonkin, let's go honky tonkin. You know, the kind of these libidinal cries, right? A pleasure, like this is all about, we're going out for a night of sex and fun, uh, you, you know, but you're paying for it. So. So let's so let's listen to Hank Williams. When you are sad and lonely and have no place to go, come to see me, baby, and bring along some dough, and we'll go honky tonkin', honky tonkin', honky tonkin', honey, baby. We. So that's Hank Williams. I won't talk too much about Rose, except she just takes that vocal technique and exaggerates it. And then I can talk about, you know, what I what I think of what's the significance of this. So let's listen to Maddox Brothers and Rose. <laughs> So there's an example of what Rose Maddox was up to, right? So she takes that nasal slide of Hank Williams and his and his uh, break between chest and, and falsetto and just right. I mean, she growls nasally out that hong, you know, honky tonkin. And then the band members are whistling, right? So it sounds like sounds like a brain donkey, right? Like the animalistic desires get mapped onto the sexuality. You know, she's like almost making a parody of of the honky tonk and making a parody of honky tonkin. And you have to, you know, what I think is so interesting is she's performing this really at the time to a, an oaky audience really struggling in California with not being considered respectable, right? Not even cons being considered falling in the tropes of whiteness as they were defined in that era. And um, so she's really exaggerating the tropes of sexualized oaky bodies for her audience of okies. And I imagine they are laughing and taking delight in these tropes to get placed upon them, but having some space, right, to resist them through fun and humor and comedy. So I think, you know, so there's kind of, and she does this all the time, you know, but she'll change her vocal style. She'll can sing a honky tonk ballad just as beautifully, but with this more open throat technique, like then um, Kitty Wells, she can sing in this kind of gospel manner with a really nasal strident sound and Philadelphia lawyer, Woody Guthrie song. But um, yeah, so, so that's a bit of a little humor, a little rosematics for us today. Um, what a great example. And I hope you're hearing some or seeing some of the comments in the text chat, Stephanie. Um, 
since uh like we're can can we hear your other example you had some carolina cotton yeah you're right so this is really contrasting <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> too many things I'm clicking. So, so this is also the same scene, right? But this is more Los Angeles, Carolina Cotton. She doesn't, um, but Carolina Cotton is also part of the Oki migration. And Carolina Cotton, she, um, she comes really of age as a performer in the live dance hall scene of California, of Southern California. And she sings with, um, Spade Cooley and his orchestra, Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys, Hank Penny and his orchestra. And she then will later go on to film. But while she's in the Western swing dance scene, she becomes this phenomenal vocalist, um, a yodeler with yodeling. And she really takes the yodel and translates its rhythmic abilities to the grooves of Western swing. And often when she performs with Spade Cooley, she is the, her vocal um, solo, her vocal yodel solo acts as the grand finale and also as a breakout solo. Like she is a series of, of um, she follows after a series of electric guitar taking the solo, steel guitar taking the solo. And then we have Carolina Cotton. And what she does with her solos is, I mean, she's very good. She like will syncopate her yodel melody, but then she does this thing where she yodels at really, really quick um, tempo of 16th notes, and she moves up and down by step and half step really fast. So, and this was, this was really seen in by her fans and by the press. The press wrote about her as something that was very sophisticated. Like this was the virtuosity and sophistication that Western swing brought to an Oki audience. And kind of like this, you know, the hybrid of swing and country coming together. But when she goes off in film, she'll take the yodel and she'll like play up its comedic legacy, which has a long you know, comedic legacy, and she'll play the country buffoon. She'll take the yodel and play the asexual cowgirl with Gene Autry and the film Apache Country, or yeah, Apache, I think Apache Country is what it's called. Yeah, 1952 film. But here she is, 1945 with Spade Cooley, who in this film short, The King of Western Swings, Spade Cooley was dubbed the King of Western Swing. So here we go. all clap for Carolina Cotton. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of a terrible example because it leaves one so speechless. I know, right? Like wow. And we're supposed to be talking here. <laughs> right. So I'm going I'm gonna just unshare my screen because I think I mean that's it for my music for the PowerPoint. So I'll do like if I can stop share. There Is this go. the time when we were planning to uh, go to the audience? Carrie okay. says yes. Okay, great. Yeah, we have a few questions in the box. I don't know if people want to unmic themselves, but I wanted to, as as um, sort of the the host of this, I wanted to take the floor just to ask this question. That I've been, I what I have one about race and one about politics, and one I'll ask the politics one. I was watching Rose Maddox from Alabama recording with Arlo Guthrie, Philadelphia lawyer. So there's definitely a left connection there. But then Lulu Bell and Scotty singing "I'm Not a Communist" in 1952 with these libertarian lyrics, saying "Government, get out of my home, get out of my land. This is this is it for me. Just leave me alone." And I was trying to read the subversive under toe of it, but it just seemed really conservative, libertarian, mm -hmm. American individualism. So I just wanted your assessment of, of the political range of this music. Oh, it's very vast. 
I don't know if Peter LaChapelle is here, but he just wrote his book, his new book that came out on country music and politics, really does a great job. And which, right, I mean, there's such a wide range of politics being expressed through country music. And Lulu Bell, she, I mean, she, I think she was, um, later in life, I think she was a representative and she would waffle between something more liberal and more conservative, definitely. Right, so, right, and so, and, you know, we have like Minnie Pearl, um, she was supporting the governor, who's the governor for segregation in the, I think in the 40s, I mean, so, I mean, we have like, like Syria. And, and, and meanwhile, Minnie Pearl is one of the people along with Loretta Lynn, who was the greatest supporter of Katie Lang when she went to Nashville and was really hated. And right. Katie Lang has talked about that. So the contradictions, uh, Pete, Pete just weighed in and asked, are you trying to think of George Wallace? Oh, yeah, thanks, Peter. Thanks. Yeah, George Wallace. So yeah, I mean, the contradictions are vast. And I mean, I kind of have a theory <laughs> a little bit, but, and it comes out in Peter's book and made me think about it when I read his book is, is a country music and especially if country music is representing at times, I mean, not always, right? But at times this working class rural subject position, that's a contradictory one in relation to dominant society. And it doesn't neatly fit in a right left political scheme, right? I mean, populism can go left and populism can go right as we just recently saw, so, right? I mean, and that's, I think where that's coming from. That's where you have this kind of pull, right? So, I mean, talk about the need of like more parties so in a very rigid binary political system. So I think that's part of the reasons why we see like this fluctuation. I mean, Woody Guthrie, as you know, Pete has also written about in his first book, Pete, I mean, he is of the left and he is voicing a, you know, he is voicing against like the agricultural business of California, how it's exploiting labor, right? I mean, very much so. And Rose Maddox, Maddox Brothers and the Rose take as Philadelphia lawyer, and they also turn that into a show. I mean, they literally mime it out and some, you know, they have a water pistol, it hits the wrong person, another person drops in, you know, but at the same time as all of this comedy is happening on stage, Rose Maddox sings it straight as if it's this earnest thing. But so it's kind of this interesting incongruity in, in that moment. So that so I think politically, right? So politically, there's a lot of, I think, complexity and, and um, right, paradoxes, definitely. And also, if I just can throw out this question, and I'm dying to know it, this is a fascinating conversation. I just want to know, what is the intersection with Black women blues singers? Because I, you know, listened to Rose Maddox sing Wild, Wild Young Men, and then Ruth Brown also recorded it. And I hadn't heard of Ruth Brown before. And then I'm thinking of women blues singers like Sister Rosetta Tharp and Gail Wald's book, Shout, Sister, Shout. I mean, what are the intersections here? So, I mean, part of the intersection is Rose Maddox functioning as a rockabilly artist covering rhythm and blues, right? I mean, that is a narrative that's, that's part of popular um, U.S. Um, musical culture, right? There is that aspect. And, and it is, it's Ruth Brown's song, right? It's not Maddox, it's Ruth, Mad it's Ruth Brown, Wild Wild Young Women. She records up first and then... Um, and rockabilly, right? Rockabilly of like a lot of racial appropriation and racial appropriation for in country music, giving the kind of the permission for a wider expressive range that kind of white Southern culture kind of keeping it constrained, but using black appropriation for that. And I mean, we see that all the time. We saw that in like the British blues bands, right? I mean, using images and sounds of black masculinity and sexuality as a means to counter like 1950s Cold War culture, but right. Go ahead. Stephanie, I'm just wondering, given the specific, uh, the, the particular history of country music as having been forcibly split from R&B yes. and, right. and yes. arbitrarily designated as separate categories of music yes. by the American music industry at the birth of, right. of, of the, the recording industry, yes. if that doesn't, make it maybe a little more complicated than uh, straight up appropriation by the, you know, the British uh, uh, inva yeah. invasion. 
Right. Yeah, that is that is very important. Thank it's, you. It's more like the return of the repressed, right? That that um, black and white musicians had been uh, doing the same songs. I mean, Ruth Brown wrote her her songs, but black and white musicians had been singing, playing in the same styles, doing the same music um, for for years uh, before the industry uh, synthetically separated them into two racialized categories of music. That is true. And very like, this is a great point that yes, because I mean, even when the, the things were separated and Charles Wolf writes about this really early on and then so many other scholars of well, of, um, of well, as well, but like, you know, hearing a white blues person or hearing a white um, country art, a country, country artist singing the blues would then get marketed under race records because the Northern executives couldn't tell the difference orally. They were just like, we, right? So, I mean, there was a lot of confusion. So this like, this sonic segregation, right? Of the music of, industry. Of Southern, of Southern working class uh, music yeah. specifically, right? Definitely, yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Let's take questions from, from our audience. If you want to unmute yourself or raise your hand and join the conversation. Peter LaChapelle, did you, I don't want to put you on the spot, but did you want to comment on uh, the politics of country music? Sure. Um, no, I, I love the uh, Stephanie. I'm a big fan of Stephanie's um, and her work. It's really amazing. And it's actually changed my own approach to the way I study things I do. And I think one thing I was thinking about with the issue of race and all of that is I, I've done a little research on Billy Grammer, who, um, you know, came, he in the late 50s came out with uh, Gotta Travel On, which has this long history that goes really back to slavery and, um, and, and blue singers in the 20s and W.C. Handy kind of finding it. And there is, and so I think the race component of it is really central, like to this, this story. And, um, you know, I think it's interesting too, to think about how these women performers are coming forward and trying to make careers. And then how do they, what do they do with that issue of segregation and those sorts of things? And, you know, I think it does sometimes, you know, we talking about blues influences or uh, those sorts of things. I think that that's something that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something we got to get into more. And, you know, I kind of think about what the grammar example, like he, um, when he was um, selling the song Gotta Travel On, which, by the way, he used a lot to promote George Wallace when he sort of became George Wallace's campaign band <laughs> later on in his career. Um, he, um, you know, he he tried to hide the, the Black origins of the song and talked about it as coming from England and, you know, all this sort of stuff. And so... Um, it's, it's, it's interesting stuff to sort of unpack and it's complicated, so. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, Peter. Um, Brian, you had your hand up. Yeah, hi, Stephanie. Um, I, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed the book and I think as, a, as someone that's mostly interested in music analysis, um, I, I wanted to echo what Dean said, that I think that your contribution to the idea, these are the importance given to vocality and, and country music is, is really, it's, it's, it's incredible. You made a really, really important contribution. Um, so one of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately is, is in, uh, music and embodiment and the way that when we listen to music, oftentimes we, one of the ways that we derive the kind of feeling is by covertly trying to sing like the person that's that we're listening to you know um so you know when you say that we can hear a nasal twang as like a sort of aestheticized sense of strain or something like that i might go further and say that actually we feel strain when we when we hear someone singing with nasal twang because our body kind of is trying to do that kind of covertly right um, hey. And in that sense, I think that yodeling is really, really interesting because it's a covert way of expressing that sense of freedom. Because to produce, to, to, to yodel, as, as I think you know now, like you have to 
free your vocal cords, right? It's, it, you have to, so when we're, when we're hearing someone yodel, my sense is that maybe we are feeling free in a way, you know? Um, so yodeling, I think is also cool because it's, it's untexted, you know, to yodel, you just sing yodel. <laughs> that's, that's all, that's all you say, right? So for someone that may be interested in expressing the idea of like a gendered idea of, of freedom and the expansiveness of the West and all this stuff, it's a way of, of, of making people feel that way without having to say it, you know, right. which could be, I think, really, really powerful. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if you, I'm curious what you think about, about this idea, especially since you have so much experience now learning to yodel. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it was really hard for me to do yodeling. So that I found really, really, <laughs> I'm not very good at it. So it's not like I can do it very <laughs> quickly. It's a really slow, slow process. But yeah, but it is a uh, right. And I think the I think the timbre of yodeling, right? You're loud. And when a woman yodels, it's really showcasing that bright timbre of the head voice, right? And it, I mean, it's like, it's virtually, you know, it's like operatic in that mm -hmm. sense. So I think it's very showy. And I also, and I think it's, um, yeah, and it's very um, virtuosic and, and I, it translates nicely to all of those like yearning for the mythical freedoms of the West, right? Or not wanting to be tied to the home, like Patsy Montana, who becomes like our first virtuosic cowgirl yodeler is singing like the she buckaroo, right? She's a man hating lassie, a she buckaroo, or the winch from Wyoming, or the tomboy gal from Texas, right? She sings all of these, from all these subject of, um, positions of gender variance that the cowgirl allows her to inhabit, and then she inhabits it vocally through the yodel. And fans, fans were really concerned about her yodeling. Fans wrote in and they're like, oh, she's going to ruin her voice because it's highlighting the break. And But they would hear Patsy Montana's singing voice. They would characterize it as sweet, right? It's that sweet mm. sound, right? It's rounded tones, intonation, nice smooth transitions from head to chest. And they would say, oh, this is a sweet sound. But oh, my God, she's going to ruin her voice if she keeps yodeling. The so last three minutes of what you've said could be the start of a piece <laughs> on um, that, that, that queers yodeling. <laughs> yes. There, there's such an implicit, there's such a subtext already in, in all of that. Right. Yeah. And then when Carolina Cotton yodels in film, she really yodels from us. Like when she's in film with Gene Autry which is so interesting, she doesn't play the romantic lead. There is no romantic lead, right? This is Gene Autry. There is no love object. He's not trying to romance, court anybody, but he has as his partner in crime, Carolina Cotton, who yodels. And when she first yodels, Autry always has his comic, you know, sidekick. And um, Pat Buttram. And so when she first yodels, Pat Buttram's like, what the hell is that? I really do not understand women. Like he's just like, I don't get it. I don't understand how to translate this. And Audrey's like, shush, shush it. <gasps> Let her yodel. <laughs> a lot of like interesting subtext about what the yodel can signify, but definitely a way out, <laughs> a way out of like kind of this rigid heterosexual type of thing. Fascinating. Um, I think we have a question from, from Carl Eddy. Did you want me to read it or do you want to unmic yourself, Carl, to ask your question about Kitty Wells? Hey, I can come off mic or on mic and off uh, video. Uh, I was curious about uh, your comment about Kitty Wells, Stephanie. And by the way, I'm enjoying this immensely. Thanks for letting me attend. Thanks um, I've never thought of Kitty Wells as a very uh, tense or bluesy sort of performer, but not a real super expressive person uh, in her live uh, visual sort of presentation. So right. I found it so interesting the, the, the way you described Owen Br Bradley's uh, quest to find that tension by raising keys on her. It seems to be, uh, it digresses from her, her visual presentation. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, well, when you watch her vision, when you watch her in live performance, her mouth is tight, right? I mean, you just see her and like, 
right? I mean, there's not a, I mean, so much throat, mouth, tongue tension when you watch Kitty Wells sing. And um, right, so there is, I mean, that sound takes a lot of work and she, uh, she puts it in, right? She puts it in into that work. Um, and you write, I'm curious as to what kinds of other manipulations were, oh no, I'm sorry, wrong person, but um, buttoned down, visual, yes, very buttoned down, right? And she's always in a gingham dress, often. Johnny Wright, though, is around her being very flamboyant and very theatrical always. So that's her husband with um, Johnny and Jack, the duo. And his tactic of pursuing tension, right, in the higher keys. So, so Owen Bradley's doing this, and right, and it's it's a lot of vocal tension. But it, but it's this vocal tension that I like I said is used as the acoustic voice of the honky tonk angel, right? Or you know, Kitty Wells sings in nineteen I think fifty eight, "Mommy for a Day," which when I first heard this, I was just like floored. She sings of being a single mom and not getting custody of the child, of her daughter. The husband, the ex-husband has custody and she can only visit her daughter every Sunday. And the implication is something went down, right? That has to do with sexual excess. And so she's singing this in 58, <laughs> Mommy for a Day. And it, it does chart, it does have commercial resonance. So, it's so, this so Stephanie, is there maybe a way in which you're saying that tragedy and heartbreak uh, as conveyed through that uh, high strained vocality um, is is not incompatible, was was compatible with the gingham dress housewife image that her um, uh, managers, her management uh, really locked her into. Yeah, I think so. I think it shows the vocal dimensions, right? She initially looks like a Southern, like June Cleaver, but she is voicing all of the tensions and concerns of the domestic, right? And it's not an idealized domestic by any means, right? So it's a domestic that's been ripped apart by divorce, child custody battles, infidelity, all sorts of things, sexual desires, or a, a, domestic, a domestic, to, domestic that's yearned for, but unattainable. Right. And that's what I love about women's honky tonk. It finally gives us something in the 1950s that points away from the domestic ideal. Right. I mean, there's other, right? I mean, there's other, like R&B does too. But I mean, but it gives us this, the, that, that like voicing the kind of injury of invisibility of white working class women in particular, of does it, wanting this but falling short. So it kind of like removes the cloak of class intersecting with gender. And this reminds me that there should be like a feminine counterpart to Barbara Ching's story of, of um, male uh, loserdom, male failure, right? In, in honky tonk music, that this right. is also about failed dreams, yeah. uh, the feminine dreams. Right, right. Right. And what's so interesting is like she does appear in the gingham dresses. She does come across as a housewife. But if you I did look really closely at the marketing, sometimes the marketing of her commercial success would just kind of implode the whole domestic frame because she was so big and so important. There's this one article coming out of Western Jamboree trade music article that or trade music magazine where they call Kitty Wells the queen of country. Roy Acuff, the king of country, but they call her husband, Johnny and Jack, the princess. They are the prince of country, right? So there's this hierarchical relationship. She reigns <laughs> and then she has her courtiers, which is her husband. So, so sometimes, you know, that dom you know, that marketing like flipped and just kind of fell to pieces. I think William Zeno has a question too. William, did you want to unmic yourself or? Uh, yes, please, especially because I actually do have a moment where uh, my neighbors are not hammering furniture, so I can actually do that. <laughs> um, first of all, uh, good afternoon, Dr. Vanderwell, and thank you just for uh, talking at length about uh, a subject that I know very little about. I find so much of it fascinating. Um, and one comment that I really liked was, um, the idea of uh, Kitty Wells' upper range being so heavily emphasized um, in her music. And so what I'm curious about is what were some 
if there were any other kinds of manipulations that were um, imposed or done uh, upon country music women in the recording studio, such as, you know, did they have to dress the part while they were there? Um, was it a case of the recording studio itself having to be at a particular temperature in order to somehow contribute to a better performance? I'm I'm curious as to what other possible manipulations could have factored into some of that. I, the one that comes to mind is Lulu Bell. So Lulu Bell, which I didn't play for you today, she, um, right, 1930s on National Barn Dance, she tries out for um, National Barn Dance and they turn her away because she blows apart the speakers. Like they can't handle it in the recording studio. She's too loud. So I think she's really doing a loud nasal twang belting thing. So she learns to temper her vocal singing and bring it in. And what you'll hear with Lulu Bell is a mixture of, of chest and head. And when she goes into her head for the up, she goes, so in her upper melody, she'll switch to her head register, but it's this nasal light patter, you know, that you hear. And she and she makes this part of her like parody when she sings like things like wish I was a single girl again when she's playing it up. So there's an example of somebody who really had to modify her singing approach for the microphone for the recording studio and for the stage for those radio mics picking her up. So that that's one that's another example that comes to mind. Um, as far as the other women in my study. Um, that, I mean, I mean, like Jean Shepard, uh, let's see. I mean, a lot of them were encouraged, right? They were really encouraged to, to take their vocal abilities to the recording studio. Hank Thompson um, encouraged a lot of the, these women like Jean Shepard and um, Wanda Jackson to, you know, to sing in the record, you know, take their like honky tonk rockabilly songs to the recording studio. So there was a lot of encouragement too. Very Thank good. you. Such that's such an interesting glimpse behind the scenes because, of course, Hank Thompson seems more like uh, a demonized figure since uh, Kitty Wells was singing so many of her answer songs against him that he was he was slut shaming women and she had to go, come to their defense in a follow up song. Right, and here he is at the same time. Hey, go you know helping like facilitate recording contracts in real life. Yeah, right, right. Hence the costume, right. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be interesting. I think Jamie Curry has our next question. Hey, Stephanie. It's hey. really, really great to um, be hearing you talk about this again. It's been a while, but it's really, really fantastic. Um, I mean, I have sort of two things. I mean, I'm kind of uh, returning a little bit to what Carrie was asking about. Uh, Carrie was asking about with regard to the political question, but not with neoliberalism, with more question about the West. Um, as an idea and in the West as ideology. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, your book seems to me to be quite clearly a major moment in the recession history of country music in the sense of recouping um, a series of histories um, about um, the profound ideological forces and values that pass through what we would otherwise think of as quotidian existence. Right. And I think that that's really, really um, incredibly impressive in that way. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, congratulations. You know, it's like it's uh, as as um, as Dean said, you know, like there are a lot of hours in the archives that go into this book, man. And I'm just like that. That's kind of really impressive. So I'm thinking about this question of reception. Right. And, I, and, and I'm not just to sort of preface this. I'm not sort of setting this up as a kind of a political or ethical trap. But I think it's a very, very important question to me anyway, at this particular moment and particularly um, in terms of the continuing nature of how we teach American history, right? Um, so I'm thinking about the future reception of this music. So you brought, you know, you're kind of entering um, these histories about, particularly one thing in, that I'm interested in here is about the way in which women could appropriate the notion of the Western freedom for their mm -hmm. own senses of empowerment and stuff like this. So my, my question is a little crude in a certain sense, um, but, but nevertheless, I think it's an important one. So the West is opened up, right, you know, um, post-Civil War, um, and that is opened up and people can move into it and they can kind of go and get their land and do all this kind of stuff. But of course, it's opened up um, in an economy with um, the allowance for the attempts of genocide of native peoples. Right. 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 
So, you know, we, we have an interesting intersection at this moment, right? You know, I'm, I'm not saying like, you know, um, Patsy Klein should be talking about, uh, Patsy Montana, sorry, should be talking about native stuff, but we have a weird, an in, a weird intersection, right? That um, language and images that purchase people empowerment discursively, nevertheless are um, in a complicated relationship with historical realities, which are, um, have been erased from the teaching of history in high schools and stuff like that. I mean, you know, uh, Native scholars who are in, involved in education in high school and middle schools are constantly trying to get these histories rewritten. And so it's more a sort of a question of how you envisage the strategies of this reception, this stuff going on from this important moment. Because you can, you know, we have to center our attentions on one thing, right? You know, so there's this, this huge question of, you know, women and country music, and you've gone and done that work, right? Um, an incredibly important and work and incredible resource how do you see and this is also music that you self-evidently love as as well as know right so there's this kind of interesting relationship that you have to it and it's, it's one of the things that's really amazing to hear you talk about it is precisely this but where do you see where would you like to see i think that's a better way of saying it the the the, the future reception of this music of thinking about the the problem of the west as an ideological image which is constructed on um, you know horrific um, on a certain level horrific historical details as as we move forward and particularly you know in a time now where you know we we acknowledge um, um, whose land we're on and we acknowledge um, what's going on and we're trying to um, redress horrific imbalances in the academy etc cetera, etc cetera. not just to you know how many African American scholars we have but you know how many in, Indigenous scholars do we have and, and where does that occur in our histories and stuff so how how do we do that how do you imagine that dance happening using this incredible information that you've given and, but with this other history that people are also trying to make us remember or, or redress. I just sort of wonder how you sort of see that in the future as a sort of your work, your practice as a historian. Yeah, those are those are good questions. I think I mentioned this in the book. I think I do. Um, when it comes to the singing cowgirl, right, it's taking these tropes of whiteness, but not just whiteness, right, a romanticized vision mm -hmm. of, of whiteness. And this is where, you know, class and country music, you know, it doesn't, it's not a one-to-one, -one, right? It's a um, relationship. This is when like the romanticization, right, of the West becomes a means of wanting something else. So it becomes a way to displace desire mm -hmm. I and mean, becomes a means to you know, to kind of mask some of the class realities. And so like a lot of these performances, there's more than one thing going on. The singing cowgirl being an identity of autonomy and also of glamour, which, you know, Dean pointed out, right? This very glamorous at times, right? I mean, could be rugged, masculine, you know, could be very rugged as well, but also could be very glamorous in their cowgirl outfits. And glamour being a trope for working class women as very similar to respectability, but as a trope to dress up class, mm. right? To make it more access acceptable. Glamour, un you know, glamour, unlike respectability, glamour has more agency in it. It allows more variance, you know, and there's different ideas of glamour. Glamour can be sparkling. It can be this beautiful cowgirl outfit. It can be a vocal style of rounded tones. I mean, all of that is glamorous. And, and an audience has heard like Kitty, or not Kitty Wells, they heard Patsy Montana with her sweet vocality as as glamorous. So, so as a woman occupying all of these different moments of great destiny ideology, right, that is firmly established on the bedrock of genocide, right, great, great, you know, go west, young man, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and go west, young man, because you have no other opportunities out here in the east. You know, industrialism has already taken you and spit you out. You can't be a breadwinner of any sort. So here, go west and maybe you can find some opportunities. So, I mean, going west was also a class narrative. I mean, we kind of romanticize it with all this like cowboy stuff, but who's going west? People who can't afford to live in the East, right? People who are exploited 
in the, in, in the factories and dangerous and losing their fingers <laughs> and, or their, you know, you know, right. So they go West. West is supposed to always, West becomes in the United States, the emblem of opportunity, right? And, and so, and so the singing cowgirl occupies that space, definitely of opportunity and feminizes it through the tropes of like a rugged sense of autonomy or through the tropes of glamor, of bringing respectability to the to a working class rugged type of image. And you have like Calamity Jane, you know, if you just trace it in film, Calamity Jane, her first, like there's Calamity Jane, the historical figure, Calamity Jane in early film that slowly becomes more feminized <laughs> as we go into like 1950s film and all of a sudden she's played by, you know, somebody like Doris Day or something like that. So, so yeah, so there's all of these like intersections, definitely. I mean, just to say like, you know, I come to country music, you know, when I was young and, and um, on the West Coast, because of the migration out of the kind of Southern Plains, my family ended up there and I so wanted to be a cowgirl. I just so, I wanted out of my working class kind of locked in space, you know, and the cowgirl, right? The cowgirl, she could ride a horse, she could rope. My aunt, she rode a motorcycle to round up cattle. I mean, I wanted to be that. I wanted so out of the confines of of what working class respectability, right? It was just like, ooh, it's a straight jacket. So um, yeah, so some of these are like the romanticized tropes, like mapped onto class, but yes, they're, but definitely um, indebted to a uh, manifest destiny. And, and so you do see some of this coming up, like Carolina Cotton, when she's with Jean Autry in Apache country, Apache country, right? Autry makes the gesture of including Native Americans playing Native Americans. Mm -hmm. And he is trying to educate 1950s Cold, Cold War audiences about Native Americans. So he does bring in indigenous individuals. But at the same time, there's a lot of tropes that get that still get reinscribed. And Carolina Cotton, what makes her an interesting figure in that film is she is an insider knowledge to, to the, you know, to Native Americans. Like she is a friend and she knows the inside information because that helps them because it's always a crime, right? Who committed what? And so she, with this insider information, she is able to solve the conflict of the film and we have resolution. Mm -hmm. And it's not a resolution that's based on a marriage trope. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, there's kind of like a claustrophobia of political space in a certain sense. I mean, I guess that's what I'm getting at, that, you know, like the, the need to open up a space in a certain level, how, that bumps into something else, right? And it's the question of that claustrophobia of, you know, um, competing concerns, even if they're like competing yes. concerns that are ones that we validate, is an interesting feature of talk about, talking about anything culturally, you know, in, in later stages of modernity. And I think that that's, um, it's very interesting to hear you talk it and see how, you know, one thing opens something up, but then it overlays something else and then you kind of clear in that way. So, I mean, it, it's fascinating to talk about it, but thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure listening yeah, to you. Thanks for your question. Yeah, wonderful. I, I we're winding down now and uh, your anecdote reminds me of what my advisor said in graduate school Stephanie that all books all academic books are autobiographical and your own story is sort of part of this and the love of the music as well and the both of you the, the love for this music is so clear and this has been such a fascinating conversation and I learned so much from Patsy Montana's sweet vocality to Carolina Cotton's yodeling to Rose Maddox honky tonk groan and different registers of, of feminist vocality which is just so poignant I love that I, you guys have to write queer yodeling I think there's definitely potential in that Dean but Dean, I wanted to ask if you have any closing words. You wonderful interlocutor. Thank you so much for joining us. I wanted you to to have the last remarks. Uh, I, I just want to say thank you. I've learned a ton myself, and um, I have loved all the the attention from this uh, big audience you drew. And so I want to thank y'all for organizing such a great event and inviting me to be part of it. And once more, just to congratulate Stephanie on. Uh, this uh the achievement of your book and also on on uh 
doing such a fabulous job today. Thank you. Well, thanks for being here, Dean. Really appreciate it. Such a pleasure.